You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, welcome to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. This program is brought to you by the Good Elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and 30 faithful congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout a four-state area. We invite you to worship with them whenever you might have the opportunity. You'll see their names at the end of this program today. We have three gospel preachers with us. They've been doing a fantastic job answering your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. I'm Mike Tucker. I preach at the Northside Church of Christ in Mayfield, Kentucky. My name is David Gulledge. I work and serve with the Whitlock Church of Christ located in Paris, Tennessee. I'm Nat Evans. I preach for the Hickory Grove Church of Christ in Callaway County, Kentucky. We're grateful that they are with us and we're glad for these good questions. Let's get right to them today. Our first question to Brother Gulledge. Brother Gulledge, do we still need the Old Testament now that we have the New Testament? Brother Gulledge. Thank you so much for the question. Let me just go ahead and answer the question and then we'll look at it with some scriptures. Absolutely, we, we do need the Old Testament even though we have the New for this simple reason. If we did not have the Old Testament, you would not understand the New Testament. And so let's look at some verses. I want to uh, prove this point to you uh, with some scripture. First of all, notice what Paul said, and it's a verse that is most likely familiar to most of us. But Paul said in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and hope of the Scriptures might have hope. This is the purpose of the New Testament. At the Whitlock congregation in Paris, we just a while back, finished going through the book of Romans. We, we looked at it. It took about maybe a year for us to go through the book and look at Romans. If you were to study the book of Romans, what Paul is doing, his main thesis, his main idea within the book, is he is proving to the churches at Rome that they are under a new law, a new covenant. They are no longer under the old law which the Judaizing teachers were trying to push upon the people, they were no under, longer under that law, but rather there was a new covenant, the covenant of Christ, the New Testament, which they were to live under. But within that book, Paul doesn't only show that the old law was done away with, and, and he doesn't say that it's useless, but rather it is there for our learning. We are there to learn from the Old Testament the Old Testament is to be used in its proper way. Today, individuals try to live and abide by the Old Covenant, which has been done away with. And so we are to study it and to learn from it. We don't live under it any longer. We aren't binding uh, by its principles and its commandments, but rather it's there for our learning and so that we can understand uh, the, the New Testament. In one way... The Old Testament is a divine commentary in advance of the Christ who was to be the Messiah and what He was to do. It strengthens our faith in knowing that Christ fulfilled the Old Testament. Imagine the things that you and I would not know if we did not have the Old Testament. For example, let me list some things for you that you and I would have no knowledge of if it was not for the Old Testament. For example, we wouldn't know about the creation. We wouldn't know about the origin of mankind, the origin of sin. We wouldn't know about the destruction of sin and how man's sin was, was cast from the garden. We wouldn't know about the uh, the origin of marriage and how God created man and woman and placed them together and said in Genesis 2 that man should leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. You and I would not understand the promise of the Messiah that was given to Abraham. 
We would not know or understand the teachings of the prophets of old. We wouldn't know many of the Old Testament characters that were in the Old Testament. For example, if you and I were to go to the New Testament and we were to turn to what we refer to as the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and there we read about individuals that were recorded and acknowledged for their great faith, such as Abraham and others who are, are recorded within this great chapter, recorded for their faith. You and I would not know who they were if we did not have the Old Testament. And so it is there again for our learning. We, we learn so much about the New Testament from the Old Testament. It, 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 they're parallel to each other. They go hand in hand. Another and a final ex uh, uh, a reason why we have the Scriptures, I'm sure many of you, such as myself, we have a book or a chapter within the Old Testament where we turn to for comfort. Many, many individuals turn to the Psalms and they read the Psalms in time of need. It is there to comfort us, to, to, to learn from the experiences of others, such as the Psalms of David in Psalm 23 or Psalm 51. And we read about in time of need, perhaps when we suffer the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job or or whenever we are going through the storms of life. So often we turn to the Old Testament and we look at Psalms, we look at Proverbs, maybe Ecclesiastes, and we look at these passages and these books to comfort us in times of need. And so absolutely we do need the Old Testament. But let me give you one final uh, passage to couple that with Romans 15.4. But if you were to turn over to Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, we have the scene where Jesus approached John the Baptist and was going to be baptized of John, but John was reluctant and he did not want to baptize Jesus because Jesus was sinless. And Jesus said this, notice the words of Christ in verse 15. Matthew 3 and verse 15, But Jesus answered and said unto him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Time and time again, Jesus refers to fulfilling the old law, fulfilling the law. And so if you study the life of Christ, His purpose was, he, he, there were many purposes, but, but He fulfilled the law. And his birth fulfilled the law, the law and the prophets. His, his death, His life, His ministry. So if you want to understand the Messiah... His virgin birth, his, his baptism and his life and his death, it was all prophesied about within the Old Testament. And so we need the Old Testament to fully understand and appreciate the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ. We understand Him more, we, we know His mission, we appreciate Him more when we understand that He fulfilled the prophecies written within the Old Testament. And so what a great question. Do we need the Old Testament? Absolutely. Because through it we learn things that was written for our learning. But then secondly, we, we learn about and we understand and we appreciate our Messiah even more through a study of the Old Testament. I hope that this answers your question. Thank you, Brother Gulledge. Brother Evans, we have this question that was sent in by a viewer who watches the Bible Answer over the Internet. He asks, are Extension Bible Schools scriptural in their setup? Can a foreign preaching school be touted as being an extension of another Bible institute located in the USA, even though the foreign preaching school carries its own name, has its own location, and is under the oversight of another sponsoring congregation? We'll give that to you, Brother Evans. The authority to teach the Bible to others grows out of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and Mark 16, 15, and 16, and 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. But the truth must always be taught all of the time, but the exact location, the facilities, and the number of instructors falls under generic authority and thus becomes a matter of judgment. Now, if you have a preacher training school in the USA where the Bible could be taught faithfully, why couldn't you do the same across a river or in another state, or for that matter, across an ocean in another continent? 
as long as an eldership of a congregation does not rule over another congregation and destroy its autonomy, I know of no boundary to its mission work. For example, could a congregation in Kentucky or Tennessee or Alabama support or send a missionary to Iringa in Tanzania, Africa, and help support a missionary there in his efforts to teach the gospel of Christ. That's where my youngest son is as a missionary and trying to teach lost souls the gospel of Christ and doing, and doing a fine job at doing that. Can Congregation A send funds to Congregation B for the purpose of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Could Congregation A send a preacher to Congregation B for the purpose of preaching the gospel of Christ? Could Congregation A send a New Testament to Congregation B for the purpose of preaching the gospel of Christ? I believe that they could, but there are those among us who say they can't. Can you imagine such that the congregations could not cooperate together in carrying out the great commission of our Lord? As a matter of fact, they have affirmed in public debate that Congregation A cannot send funds to Congregation B for the purpose of preaching the gospel of Christ. That's making a human law, and that's elevating, uh, for example, the body above the soul. And the reason I say that is, they say that Congregation A may send funds to Congregation B for evangelism, uh, or for, rather for benevolent purposes, and that's not sinful. But if you do it for purposes of evangelism, then it becomes a sin. Well, that would elevate the needs of the body above the needs of a soul. Can you imagine that? Well, our Savior is the one that gave the Great Commission. And we recognize that according to biblical principle, that the soul is more important than the body. Matthew 16, verse 26. And we need to recognize that while a lot of brethren are squabbling over matters of indifference, that millions are dying untold. We live in a world where there are seven billion people, and they need the gospel. In Proverbs 11:30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that is wise when a souls. Are we being wise or otherwise? We better be careful lest we minor in majors and major and minors. We need to be trying to do our best to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed for unity among his followers in John 17, 20 and 21. Paul taught that we all to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. As brethren, we are to forbear one another in love and keep diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Strife and discord and division is destructive of the peace of the brotherhood, but it also hampers the great amount of good that a united brotherhood could accomplish in carrying the gospel to the entire world. John 17, 20 and 21. Brethren, we must love one another in order to go to heaven. Let us keep in mind the great restoration slogan from long ago. In matters of faith, unity in matters of judgment, liberty, and in all things, love. And let us never forget that while we spend time squabbling among ourselves as brethren, that untold millions are dying untold. Are we being as wise as we should be in these matters of judgment? And let us make sure that where it's not matters of judgment and carrying out the Great Commission, that we get busy in doing that. We thank you for this question. Thank you, Brother Evans, for the outstanding answer. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, The Second Coming of Christ and the Millennium. If you'd like to have this excellent tract by Brother V. Howard, or if you'd like to have our eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, or both, they're absolutely free. Or if you'd like to send us your question, just contact us. You can do that by writing us at Philip Street Church of Christ, 912 Philip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net, or you can call our toll free number, 1 800 436 0463. If you get the answer machine, be sure to leave 
your question or else leave your full address on the answer machine so that we can mail you the requested materials. Again, they're free of charge. Also on the screen, you're seeing our web address, www.abibleanswertv.com. We invite you to go to our website and watch past programs of A Bible Answer archived there or send us your question by means of our contact page. Now back to our questions today. Our next question to Brother Tucker. The person says, I was rejected and abandoned by someone very close to me, someone I trusted closely with secrets, struggles, and victories in life. The pain of the betrayal was intense. How should we respond to betrayal? Brother Tucker. Talk about a question that hits the heart. This certainly touches each one of us where we live. The best answer that I can offer begins and is rooted in having the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. The Bible challenges us to try to learn to think like Jesus thought. Jesus was one that in all points was tempted like as we are and yet without sin, the Hebrew writer says. In the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 53, before it ever happened by over 700 years, the Bible told us about how Jesus would be treated and he was. He was despised and rejected and acquainted with grief. Verse 7 of Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and yet when he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth as a lamb that is led to the slaughter, as a sheep that is before its shearers is dumb, so we open not his mouth. Paul gave good commentary on Jesus the night of his betrayal. The Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body which is for you, this do in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Jesus died because of Judas's betrayal. It's interesting when you look at the harmony of it. We understand that betrayal hurts very deeply. Jesus was betrayed by one of His chosen ones, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4 says. The betrayal would come in a close fellowship meal. He had longed to eat the Passover with the disciples, Matthew 26 and verse 23. And He was betrayed with a hypocritical kiss of love and adoration and, and greeting. Betrayed into the hands of sinners, Matthew 26, 24. Betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That's the price of a slave. According to Exodus chapter 21 and verse 32, Matthew 27 verse 9. Matthew 26 verse 24 gives us hope. God will take care of betrayers. Woe unto the man that through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had not been born. Here's some good counsel for a wounded heart when you're hurting from betrayal. Luke chapter 6, beginning verse 27, Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, there's hope. By your words you'll be justified. And if you choose bad words, by your words you'll be condemned. The truth of the matter is, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 that we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that we might receive the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. That's true of those who try to have the mind of Christ, who try to act and react like Jesus did. It's also true of those who have made wrong choices and continue in the wrong way. I hope there's something about those passages that will give comfort to the one hurting so bad from betrayal. Thank you, Brother Tucker. Brother Gulledge, this question has come in. Does continued praying for something show persistence in prayer or a lack of faith? Brother Gulledge. Whenever you and I study the Scriptures, we find that there are a lot of aspects that we can implement into our prayer life to make our prayers more effective. 
the persistence of a petition is another factor that the Bible indicates has a bearing on the um, effectiveness of my prayer. And so continuing in prayer does show persistence. However, the Bible teaches, and we'll look at two parables of the Lord, persistence affects my prayer. It makes it more effective. It does not show a lack of faith. In fact, the opposite is true. Whenever you and I do not continue in prayer, then we are showing a lack of faith. But whenever we are persistent in prayer, uh, our prayers become more effective. Very quickly, let's notice two parables from our Lord, both from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, we find a persistent widow. Here Jesus tells a parable of a widow who goes before an unjust judge. The gospel writer said, Then he, being Jesus, spoke a parable unto them, that men always ought to pray and never lose heart. The parable Jesus told in this context was about a widow who made a request to an unjust judge. Her request was noble and right, but the unjust judge did not think that he needed to notice her, that he, he needed to acknowledge her petition. Her request uh, was then o repeated over and over, and so due to her persistence, however, and because of her, quote, continual coming to the unjust judge, as the text says, the judge finally granted her petition. Jesus then commented, commented that if an unjust judge can give and be swayed by persistence, how much more effective is the persistent prayer of a virtuous woman whenever you and I approach the judge of all the earth? And so think about this parable of, an un, of a widow who is persistent with an unjust judge and how she continues to come before him, being persistent, bringing her petition before him. And finally, through this persistence, he gives, he gives in to her request and he grants her her petition. And so the idea that Jesus gives there is here's an unjust judge and then you've got the righteous judge of all the earth, God in heaven, and how if you and I will go before Him and be persistent, how much more will He give to us? Here you have an unjust judge and a, and a judge or a just judge, God Himself. But then He gives a second parable, and we have to go backwards seven chapters to Luke 11. In Luke 11, verses 5 through 13, Jesus told of a man who visited his neighbor at midnight requesting bread to feed a guest. So here's a parable Jesus tells of a man who had company at midnight and he needed bread to feed and so he goes to his neighbor. And he asks his neighbor, and perhaps because of being tired, <coughs> excuse me, because of being tired, the, uh, the neighbor refused to give bread. And so this man was also very persistent in coming before his neighbor asking for bread. And he was continually turned down. But Jesus tells about how through the persistence of going to this neighbor, he finally gave in and granted his neighbor bread. And so two parables here that we've noticed about being persistent and how finally they gave in and granted the petition. So looking at persistence here, when we think about being persistent, if we notice Luke chapter 11, I want to notice this as I wrap up my question. Looking at persistence, in Luke chapter 11, after Jesus gives the parable of a friend who comes at midnight, he's persistent, he's asking for bread, his friend gives up, he gives him everything that he needs. Verse 8, Jesus said, And I say unto you, though he will not rise and give unto him, because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. But then we get to verses 9 through 13. Notice what the Lord says. Verse 9, Jesus said, So I say unto you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and he who, find, or he who knocks it will be opened. And he continues on through verse 13. The idea there is 
to seek and to ask and to knock, not just on one occasion, but to keep doing it. He who keeps on seeking, he who keeps on knocking, he who keeps on uh, asking, it will be given unto him. It will be opened unto him. He will find if he is persistent in these things. And, and so prayer, whenever we are persistent, it, it shows great faith, not a lack of it. But being persistent in faith makes our prayers more effective. And, and so what a great question about the persistence of prayer. In fact, throughout Scripture, persistence pray, plays a prominent role in effective prayers. Just for your uh, considerations, Philippians 1.4, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Ephesians 6.18, Luke 2.37. Show the persistence of prayer. I hope this has answered your question. Thank you so much to each of these good brethren for the outstanding job they have done in answering your questions. In Clifford Lewis's poem entitled, I Give Thee Humble Thanks, the last paragraph says, I give thee humble thanks for Christ who came from heaven above, for the Christ and his redeeming love, for his mighty power to seek and save, for his glorious triumph o'er the grave, for the lovely mansions in the sky, for his blessed coming by and by, I give thee humble thanks. We should give thanks for Christ who came from heaven above. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John 1.14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the cross and his redeeming love. 1 John 3.16, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We give thanks for his mighty power to seek and save, for he came to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19 and verse 10. We give thanks for his glorious triumph over the grave. He's begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection from the dead, 1 Peter 1 and 3. We give thanks for the lovely mansions in the sky, John 14, 2 and 3. And we give thanks for his blessed coming by and by, 1 Thessalonians 5. In verse 23, are you thankful as one of the redeemed? Are you a Christian? By faith, turn from sin, confess your faith in Christ, put the Lord on in baptism even today for the remission of your sins. Are you living faithfully that you might be preserved blameless at his second coming? We pray that you are. Thanks for watching. Remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.